It's Platt, and today we head for the mountains. That's next on Platt's Beer of the Week. So the uh, particular beer we have today is Bush Beer. It comes to us from the fine folks at Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, it is part of the AB InBev massive portfolio of beers. Uh, they're the largest uh, beer company in the world, and this is one of their uh, products. Uh, some people might know it, know it as Bush Beer with the uh, elongated uh, enunciation. Uh, Bush Beer, a little background into Bush Beer, is um, it is named after Adolphus Bush, the former president of the company and the gentleman that created Budweiser, of course, the flagship beer. Uh, when this beer was first released, that was one of the selling points, like it's named after the owner. It must be good. Um, originally, uh, the beer was known as Bush Bavarian Beer. It came out in 1955. It was uh, Anheuser-Busch's first new release since the end of Prohibition. When Prohibition ended, you basically were just trying to get back to producing beer and just selling as much of your flagship beer as possible. Uh, American palates had kind of dulled and simplified throughout Prohibition, so they were just wanting your big brand, you know, of generic American lager. And uh, so this is Anheuser-Busch's first new beer they tried uh, after Prohibition. Uh, the name eventually changed in 1979. They dropped the Bavarian part and just became Bush Beer. Uh, it is Anheuser-Busch's second most popular line of beer. Now, you don't, again, see a ton of marketing for it, however, but it fits a niche spot. It is the Anheuser-Busch's value tier. Uh, below Budweiser, you have Bush, similar to Miller. There's Miller Lite, and then you have Milwaukee's Best. Coors with Keystone. It's the value line. And again, these beers don't get a lot of praise, obviously, or, you know, notoriety or marketing behind them, but they fill a valuable niche and they sell a ton of the stuff. So uh, as much as we might, beer snobs might want to poo-poo it. They, they move a ton of product. Um, the uh, product itself is marketed uh, now as kind of a mountain man, outdoorsy, rugged, you know, uh, the slogan, head for the mountains, a bush. In the commercials, you might see someone pulling a six pack out of the cold river that they keep it in or something like that. Um, also to the marketing of Bush in particular has been closely tied with NASCAR. They've had a long uh, relationship with NASCAR. They used to sponsor something called the Bush Series which is NASCAR's equivalent to AAA. There's NASCAR, the main series, and then there was Bush series down below, similar to, again, baseball. And you think about how the beer itself is kind of thought of, you know, you have Budweiser, that's the major leagues, and then Bush was AAA. Uh, so it kind of fits um, marketing-wise with how the view beers, you know, perceived. Um, I believe Bush still sponsors a driver named Kevin Harvick for all you NASCAR fans out there. Not, not a big fan of the sport, so I don't know a lot, but supposedly they uh, sponsor him. As far as other products in the, the line, um, again, this is not just Bush beer, but a product line. Uh, they have also Bush Light, which is a 4.1% alcohol by volume beer. Um, again, everybody was cutting calories 30 years ago or so, so you have to have a light. Uh, they also have a Bush Ice, 5.9% alcohol by volume, something we've talked about, especially with the va the value beer shopper. Uh, can I get as much alcohol per dollar as possible? And these ice beers, again, fill that niche in the value brand. They also have a Bush non-alcoholic. And last but not least, they do something that at first I had to do a double take, but now I kind of get, and I can see where it might fill, fill a niche, and it is called Dog Brew. Uh, it does not have any actual alcohol or hops in it. It is a uh, pork bone broth based. They have additional herbs and spices and you know, flavoring. But I, from what I gather, it's in a can and you could give your dog a dog brew. And if you think about it, a dog's man, best friend, you know, and we drink beer with our best friend. So, yeah, it makes sense. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where this goes, if it creates some kind of new niche or whatever or not. But I... I do have to give whoever is an R&D at Bush kind of a nod, like, all right, we, this is something, you know, uh, different. 
Well, before we try this particular beer though, let's check out the stats. So today I thought I'd talk about um, something. When I do a lot of the, when I've recently done some of these old school brands or the value brands, your, you know, Paps and Lone Star Water, I get a lot of comment. Oh, this is just cheap beer. This is the bottom of the shelf. This is college beer, and it's you can't go any lower. That's not true. <laughs> um, for some of you younger viewers, maybe not. But if you're a little bit older, if you're if you're my age, you remember the '70s and '80s. There was a step lower, and I want to talk about that today, and that's generic beer. And when I talk about generic beer, some people may refer to Bud Miller and Coors as generic beer. Oh, no, 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 there was another level. Literally just a blank label that just said beer on the can. Uh, these were generally uh, sold in just six packs. Sometimes you may have bought them in cases. Uh, they were more of a tin can, not the current aluminum that we deal with today. They had, instead of the pop tops that we're used to, they had the old school pull tabs. And you had to be careful with them because sometimes you'd snap them off and then you had to get a pair of needle nose pliers to finish opening your beer. And you had a smaller opening. You didn't have the wide mouths we have today, so there's a lot of glugging. And also, too, if you, depending on how you pulled it off, you could get a little sharp piece. You'd cut your lip. But these were the cheapest beers you can find. Uh, I remember we were living in Minneapolis in the early 80s, and there was a grocery chain called Cub Foods. It was kind of the first warehouse grocery store, you know, bulk uh, grocery store I'd seen, and they sold beer, just plain beer. as a white label with black lettering that said beer, and it was a buck a six-pack. So if you had some problems with the pool tab, however, who cared? It was a buck a six-pack. And, and doing a little research, this was... Not just a Minneapolis thing. This was at the time, late seven, you know, seventies and early eighties. The economy in the U.S. wasn't so strong. This was really the first wave that the hardworking union factory worker started taking in the shorts, but they still wanted their beer. So generic beer came out. Um, like I said, I think Kroger had Cost Cutter beer, which was a yellow label with black lettering. Um, this ended up being kind of a grocery store th thing. Uh, and, and kind of their uh, answer to when Anheuser-Busch started bringing out things like Bush, when Milwaukee's Bush was coming out and Keystone was coming out, there was a value brand created by the bigger breweries. And so to compete with that, you had to go the next level lower, thus generic beer. Uh, a lot of these uh, were produced not, not by the grocery stores themselves. This was kind of the first private label type thing going on there. Um, but you'd have a regional breweries. You had breweries like Falstaff and Pearl that would come in and produce these beers for a regional gro grocery store chain. No marketing behind it. Probably a little more adjunct, a little less malt, you know, behind it. Maybe a hop extract, still real hops. Um, and again, the most rudimentary of uh, beer can technology. Thus, though, you could get a six pack for a buck, buck fifty, something like that. And, um, you know, again, it was just something kind of reflective of the time. Also, too, this was pre craft beer movement. So people just, beer in America was just a pale lager. And if you could do it cheaper, and I still get drunk, we would do it. So that's why that was a thing for a while. Now, you still have grocery store beer uh, today. Uh, Trader Joe has their own line of beer, so they, they get produced by someone else. But now these are porters and pale ales, and they have a nice label and proper bottling, and there's a little, there's, you know, there might be a display in the store, or there's a little marketing behind it. Thus, you're probably going to pay for that marketing. Or again, this was just no marketing at all, just give me beer. And you probably threw it in a styrofoam cooler that you paid a buck for or two and filled with a buck thing of ice. So for three, four dollars, you had two six pack of beer, some ice, and a cooler. And you could go have your full, full day. Uh, can't pull that off for four dollars these days, but, uh, but we do have now proper cans and labeling or whatever. So if you ever look at like a Bush beer now or a Milwaukee's Bush, whatever, think that's the bottom of the rung. No, no, no. There, there was uh, something lower. All right. Well, enough about generic beer. Let's try this beer. All 
right. All right, plenty of bubbles. Nice little golden color. We had about a finger where the head. Let's give it a try. That is good old American beer right there. Um, get a little bit of the adjunct sweetness. Um, this being an Anheuser-Busch product, it is going to have rice as an adjunct. That's something Anheuser-Busch does that's unique compared to Miller and Coors. So again, depending on your palate or whatever, that might be actually a positive. You know, if you like the Budweiser type of beer and that rice is an adjunct or whatever, you're probably going to like this. Um, yeah, it does remind me a little bit of Budweiser in that sense. You, just the rice is a different adjunct, has a different type of sweetness to it than a straight corn um, sweetness to it. Uh, you might remember the Bud Light commercials where they're goofing on Miller and Coors for their corn syrup or what have you. Um, there's just a different adjunct. Um, I believe they use either rice syrup or rice solids as their adjunct. But again, this uh, kind of fits in. Not that much different than, than a, you know, if I had a Budweiser right now. Uh, I've been always able to pick Budweiser out in, in a taste test, but this is not too far off. And if I save a buck or two, a 12 pack, eh, I get it. I get it. Um, so again, classic old school brand, very drinkable, nothing outstanding, but again, you're saving a buck or two, so maybe there's something there. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you'd like me to try, please leave me in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bombs up.